Okay. Okay. On the on the screen you have both. So which one do you want? I don't know. Uh, no, I think that this one. is fine. Yes, it's fine. Okay, so let me first thank the organizers for pro having given me the possibility to deliver this uh, uh, seminar. I've been asked to report on the latest best results, which is quite a tough job. And so I decided to focus on other spectroscopy. Uh, the slides I will show on will be as complete as possible, but I will focus on the key points for this session. And uh, if you want more details, you can find them in the papers and on the archive preprints that are always cited on the top right corner of all the slides. So uh, let's first focus on uh, which is the experimental scenario. BEST 3 is not anymore a co collaboration composed mostly of Chinese. There is a significant contribution coming from Europe and US and uh, in particular from Italy, as you will see later. The BEST 3 spectrometer is hosted on the Beijing Electron Positron Collider 2 in that is uh, hosted by HIEP, Institute for High Energy Physics in Beijing. The BPC2 is a significant improvement with respect to the BPC, the earlier version of the collider, because we gain two order of magnitudes in uh, the top luminosity. It is huge, 10 to the 33, and let me stress the point that we have already reached more than 70% of this design luminosity. This is an electron positron collider, and the best spectrometer is also in one of the intersection points. You can see here the best spectrometer. It is again an evolution of the best two spectrometer. We gain uh, more than one order of magnitude in the energy resolution in the calorimeter, and we double the, uh, the magnetic field. You can recognize the classic onion shell structure of the detectors for particle physics, and uh, um, let me uh, uh, drive your attention here in the central part because I will later describe also a project for the upgrade of the inner tracker of the BEST3. So, uh, BEST3, um, I'm sorry, the animation failed. Okay, we collected, we started collecting data in 2009 and we collected data at the three Central mass energy corresponding to the gem side, F side prime, and F side double prime. And uh, uh, the data that has been analyzed are the blue, uh, the green numbers. Uh, data that have already been collected are the green numbers. But let me stress the point that um, we are analyzing only the blue numbers now. That means that the analysis I will report on and their statistical significances refers to one sixth, one seventh of the data available in uh, the storage now. And, uh, uh, okay, uh, the final version I will upload on the site will be completed. Let me stress the point that even if we have already collected one tenth of the intended statistics that are the red numbers, we have uh, already more data in our storage than any other previous experimental scenario. Besides these three center of mass energies for the gem psi, psi prime, and psi double prime, we uh, have collected also more data because the BPC2 can reach around 4.6 GV. These are the data sets that have been collected among these scans, and uh, most of them are intended to perform an uh, uh, investigation of the uh, charmonium states and of the exotic states that can be found in this energy range. So this is the experimental scenario, but which is the physics playground that we are dealing with? The big question is, which is the structure of the hadron? Hmm? If we consider the proton, for example, the proton is composed of three quarks that contributes with a very limited contribution to the, quark, to the mass of the proton that is mainly due to the interaction of uh, the quarks uh, by their strong interaction. So if you want to describe the inner structure of the hadrons and we want to understand the binding forces inside the hadrons between the quarks and the gluons, then we have to uh, make use of QCD and we can also make use of a tool, an approach that is called potential. 
you know that the alpha strong coupling constant has a very strong dependence on the energy scale of the phenomenon that you are considering and that means also on the distance scale that you are considering in the interaction and that means that uh, we have to deal with QCD if we want to understand which is the structure of the hadrons. The most easy uh, bound states that are uh, provided by QCD are the QQ bar pairs and the three quarks or three anti-quarks states. But even more complicated uh, states, bound states, can be hallowed by QCD. And that means that we are assume that these states may exist and we are looking for these states. We are hunting from these states in our data. So, one of the tools that uh, we use to investigate the existence of these states is Charmonium spectroscopy. Charmonium spectroscopy is not too a far concept from what has been performed in atomic spectroscopy. In that case, to investigate bound systems, you looked for the energy levels and then you investigated the transitions and the selection rules. In such a way, you could first spot the discrete energy levels in the atoms and then later with precision measurements, you could investigate fine structure, lump shift and so on and build a complete structure of uh, the atom. Now, uh, in our case, we are simply moving from a bound state of a proton and an electron that is ruled by QED to a bound state between a charm anti charm couple that is ruled by strong interaction. What we are looking for are states that are observed through their decays. So we are looking for peaks in our mass spectra. And in most of the case, a complete understanding requires a full partial wave analysis, as you have seen this morning. Uh, Charmonium spectroscopy is performing assigning a spectroscopic notation to states that accounts from the uh, quantum numbers that you may define. But you have also to consider the uh, space and charge parities that relies on the other quantum numbers. So, for example, the James I is a uh, uh, one minus minus state, and uh, it is uh, composed of a uh, uh, S wave with a spin triplet. You can have natural quantum numbers that can be assessed by a QQ bar pair, so the usual Meson description, but there are other exotic quantum numbers that cannot be explained simply making use of a QQ bar pairs, and these are those we are looking for. So we are looking for non-QQQ and non-QQ bar hadrons. There are already evidence that these states do exist. For example, the pi 1600 that has been observed by Compass and Clio. If we look in the light hadron spectrum, that is very complicated because we have broad and overlapping states. While the charmonium sector is ideal, both because we are dealing with quarks whose mass plays us exactly in the transition region between perturbative and non-perturbative regime, because the separation between the states are larger and so they should be less mixed, and because making use of free plus and minus annihilation, we can assess huge luminosities. Of course, making use of free plus and minus do as, this as a prize, because uh, in E plus and minus interaction, only the one minus minus states can be formed. And uh, that means that you can assess a secondary uh, other states only by secondary decays. That means that you have a moderate mass resolution that is related to your detector. For an example, you can look here at the mass resolution with which the KC1, that is a 1 plus plus that cannot be observed in E plus and minus directly, have been investigated in these two processes by these two experiments that belong to the same HERA. So here you can see, so that means same level of technology. This is the difference in the resolution that you have if you make use of a plus is minus. Of course, also the cross sections are lower in the case of a plus is minus with compared to P bar. But let me stress, this is an example for the eta C that is again something that you cannot form directly with a plus is minus. But in the case of E plus E minus, if you are very good at building accelerators, then you may assess very high integrated luminosities. And this is one of the key points of the BEX3 experimental scenario. 
So the approach is you try to describe with a potential, this is an example of a potential for the CC bar uh, uh, Chamonium states, uh, your system. You use the well-established states in order to tune the three parameters, and then you use the potential to predict the states, that means the spectrum, and the transition. And for a very long time, you had a remarkably good description. So what you do is looking for mass spectra, or for example, the energy of the recoil mass of the Y prime transition, and then you start assigning a meaning to each bump that you see in your distribution. For example, here is the spectra with which crystal ball discovered the ground states of the charmonium, the eta C. So let's start from low energy spectroscopy that, as I said before, is more challenging from the experimental point of view. Um, for example, let's start from the James Sarah dedicated to gamma eta eta. Uh, um, this uh, has been investigated for the first time by Crystal Ball, leading to the discovery of the F0-1710. Later, E835 acquired more statistics and understood that uh, one more resonance, the, uh, uh, the F1500, uh, was needed in order to in explain our experimental data. In BES3, we have a much larger statistics, and we could perform a full PWA that managed to rule out a tensor uh, contribution from the phase space and these other contribution from these other resonances and led to this best solution. The agreement between the experimental data and the best solution, as you can see, is excellent. And our PWA points to our uh, significant contribution, a dominant contribution of these two resonances over the F0-1500, and also to a non-negligible contribution of these two, three tensor resonances. If we consider the relative decay to, uh, to omega phi, that is a doubly as a suppressed relative decay, this process has been investigated initially by Bestu that spotted a near threshold enhancement that was uh, interpreted as a resonance with these resonance parameters and with a 10 sigma statistical significance, this pin parity. Now at Bes3, we have a much larger uh, statistics and we could perform a full PWA that could not be performed in Bestu. And uh, our best solution uh, confirm with an even larger statistical significance uh, the nature of uh, this bump related to the X1810 uh, resonance with a zero uh, plus plus uh, uh, spin parity with these resonance parameters and this uh, branch infraction that are respectively in agreement with the best two data and one order of magnitude larger than what it should be because if we take in account as a rule suppression, we should have a 10 to the minus 5 branch infraction. So we need more data to understand uh, the nature of this structure. We can rule out a contribution from the X1835 or from other uh, efforts as the PP bar enhancement I will describe later. But we cannot, for example, rule out efforts due to final state interaction or due to a below threshold contribution from the 01710. So we need to collect more data in these other decay modes or in these closely related processes in order to understand how the azirul violation explicates in James serradity decays. As I said before, I thought about a PP bar neatricial enhancement. Well, BES2 and BES3 first observed that in the relative decay to a PP bar cup, we have a clear enhancement neatricial. Now, this, this enhancement can be interpreted with an s wave rate vigor and with this compatible resonance parameter, but thanks to the higher statistics, BES3 could perform a full PWA. Now, the XPP is uh, uh, confirmed with a very large statistical significance. We are 30 sigma far from phase space. And uh, um, our, indi our PWA indicates a zero minus plan nature of this resonance with this resonance parameter and this uh, branching fraction and uh, width. 
So uh, the X1810 is clearly not due to final state interaction, and that is due to the fact that the same does not happen in, say, prime radiative decays or in James side decays to omega pp bar. This is a uh, low energy resonance that has to be understood, but the situation is more complicated than this. Because uh, James uh, Bestri observed a radiative transition to a resonance at a slightly larger mass, X1835, with these resonance parameters and with uh, uh, um, a spin parity that w is probably zero minus. A PWA is needed to understand uh, uh, this resonance, but this resonance is not the only one because we have also observed in a different process in a different final state, the X1840, again, no PWA, but a large statistical significance in these resonance parameters. And uh, even in the James Side case to Omega X1870, we see a clear narrow peak uh, so a, cl a clear narrow peak that uh, is close but at a larger mass than the resonances I shown you before. So it's quite a mess hmm? because we have a set of resonances at closely related masses that appears in the James I relative decays below the PP bar threshold that cannot be final state interaction because they are not found in the psi prime relative decays and for which we need a full program of PWA to understand the nature of these resonances and if we are dealing with a single particle or not. So even the low energy sector is able to propose surprising results. Hmm? If we look at the Psi prime, uh, relative the case, as I said, uh, the situation is pretty much different at Trichel, the enhancement is much lower. Nevertheless, if we assume the same resonance, same resonance parameters for the James Sive enhancement, we obtain this branch inflection and this reduction ratio that is lower from what should come from uh, basic QCD predictions. Mm? It should be around 12% instead is 5%. If we still consider the Psi prime relative, uh, sorry, the Psi prime decays, we have investigated these two final states that were investigated by QRC, not accounting any interference effects, and that led to the discovery of these nucleonic uh, resonances. Well, if the PWA analysis in the three of the PP bar eta final state just confirm the picture from QRC, pointing to our dominant contribution of the 1535 with an interfering phase space hmm, and uh, to a production ratio that is much lower than what QCD should provide. In the case of the PP bar pi not final state, we had quite a surprise because our best solution indicates the contribution of two new resonances that were not foreseen and confirm the fact that as in clear C, we have no contribution from these two nucleonic resonances and we have no contribution from uh, PP bar near tissue enhancement. Hmm? So we determine the branch infraction and the resonance parameters for the already known nucleonic states that are in good agreement with the literature and we determine the resonance parameters, the branch infraction and the spin parities for these two new states that have been observed with huge statistical significances. If we move from the uh, low energy adronic spectroscopy to the low energy charmonium spectroscopy, BES3 could provide quite interesting hints on the charmonium states. At BES3, we focused on the prime radiative transition of the to the radiative transition of the Psi prime, we provided the best measurement of the eta C mass. That is particularly interesting to see how changing point of view you can gain in the description of a charmonium bound states. And we observe for the first time the magnetic dipole transition of the Psi prime to the eta C prime. So let's focus on the eta C. Eta C is the ground state of the charmonium. It has been known for a very long time 
but his description was rather poor if compared with other Chamonix states. That was due mainly to the fact that you had two separate statistics in the measurement of, the, of uh, its resonance parameters, two separate data sets, one belonging to the older radiative transition measurements and one belonging to the new uh, B decays and gamma gamma process measurements. They were just two separate sets of data. This comes from the PDG. So what we performed in BEST-3 has been the investigation of this radiative transition by detecting the eta C decays in these six exclusive final states, performing a simultaneous fit of the six distributions. The outcome is a significant interference between the eta C and the non-resonant contributions, partially explaining the discrepancy that has been shown before, because older data from radiative transition had not enough statistics to perform the investigation of such interference. The outcome are resonance parameters that provide an hyperfine mass splitting that is in perfect agreement with theoretical predictions, and our resonance parameters fall exactly in the sector of the new measurements. That means that the not accounted for interference was the reason for the discrepancy with the older data from relative transitions. The eta C prime, that is the next state, has been uh, observed in different reaction mechanisms, but there was no evidence before BES3 of these magnetic dipole uh, decay, magnetic dipole transitions. We observed it for the first time considering these final states and performing a simultaneous fit of the distribution leading to these resonance parameters and to this branching fracture that combined with these measurements from Babar led to the first observation of these relative transitions with a branching fraction that is in good agreement with the potential model and with the uh, upper limit previously set by CLIOC. So you see a pattern. Hmm? If you increase the statistics and if you start to simultaneously fit different distribution of different final states, then you are merging, you are averaging on the systematics and you gain in resolution. Hmm? We will use this trick in other analysis. By the way, we have also observed uh, the same transition also considering the neutral mate, the neutral final state. The statistical significance is a bit lower, but the resonance parameters are in good agreement. You, here is a summary of the measurements. Hmm? So BEST3 uh, provided uh, the first observation of this radiative transition. But there is also one more state in Chermonium spectroscopy that is interesting and was even more poorly known before BEST3, that is HC. Uh, the spin singlet P wave state of the Charmonium. Uh, it was first reported and then confirmed at Fermilab, but its only production mechanism was observed by CLIOC that had not enough statistics to determine which were the branching fraction of this decay chain. Now, BEST3 provided a much larger statistics, and in BEST3 we are able to investigate the HC production both considering or not considering its subsequent dec radiative decay to eta C. So, for example, if we consider the pinot recoil mass, making use or not of the tagging of the radiated photon in the subsequent transition, we can perform an inclusive or a semi-inclusive uh, measurements of the resonance parameters of the HC, and we can also perform a full reconstruction of eta C decays in order to perform a full exclusive measurements of the eta C resonance parameters. For example, here you can see the finite recoil mass with and without the photon tagging, and the two analyses leads to resonance parameters that are in good agreement with the uh, area measurements from CLIOC. Hmm? The branching fraction, uh, having both of them, has been determined for the first time and are in ag excellent agreement with the theoretical predictions. If, as I said, we perform a simultaneous fit of the 16 charge decay modes of the eta C that accounts for actually 40% of the total decay modes, then again making use of the simultaneous fit, we gain resolution, we gain uh, effectiveness on our analysis and uh, we obtain resonance parameters that are in good agreement with, but much more precise than the earlier inclusive measurements. Let me stress 
one very important point that shows you how even uh, already known particles can be much better described, changing point of view. In this case, we have performed the determination of the 16 branch infraction of the 16 decay modes I've reported on before, five of them for the first time. But the key point is another one. You see which is the eta C uh, line shape. It's perfectly symmetric. While the eta C, I have been already discussed maybe some slides before, showing you that the line shape was completely asymmetric due to the interference. If you look at the eta C coming from relative decay of the psi prime, then you are affected by interference. But if you look at the eta C coming from the HC decays, then the process is interference free. That means that you have a perfectly symmetric line shape that is becoming the golden channel to assess the resonance parameters of the eta C. Hmm? For the moment, our measurement is not more precise because our statistics is incomplete. Our, anyhow, our data are in good agreement with the measurement from the relative transitions, and when the full statistics will be included in this analysis, that will be the most precise measurements of the eta C uh, resonance parameters in an interference-free approach. So let's come to the higher energy spectrum. Usually the higher energy spectrum is intended, is described as the land of exotic states. But that is not completely true. We can find conventional states also in the higher mass spectrum. Here is the potential spectrum, and you can see the yellow states that are those that have been predicted and actually discovered, actually observed. Hmm? So a lot of predicted states are still missing. The X3823 was observed for the first time by Bell, uh, decaying into a gamma chi C, providing resonance parameters with an intermediate statistical significance compatible with this state. Now at best 3 we had investigated the two leptonic decay modes of the GEMSI originating from the KC decays in that final state, making use of a large statistical uh, luminosity, a uh, large integrated luminosity, that we obtained by adding different data sets. So we are looking at the, this mass toward the recoil mass of the Pi Pi system. If we look at the gates corresponding to the two KC states, and we investigate the pi pi recoil mass, we clearly see a contribution corresponding to the 3823 in the higher energy chi C1 window that provide uh, resonance parameters in good agreement with those from Bell, but with a much better statistical significance. The statistics is not enough to resolve among the line shapes of the two particles this uh, particle may come from, or between the two hypotheses on the S or D wave, but is enough to determine production ratio and resonance parameters that are in good agreement with the, uh, with the potential. You can see here how is the trick. Mm? If you perform the evaluation of the energy dependence of a cross-section, and that overlaps perfectly the line shape of the higher energy resonance, that is a pretty good indication that the states we are observing comes from a relative transition of the parent state. This is an example in which you cannot determine this indication. Later I will show you a case in which you can determine such an indication. So it may be that we are looking at a new member of the yellow state family, hmm? those uh, final states that have been, sorry, those chamonium states that have been predicted and also observed. But we need more data to be conclusive on that. So as I said before, the higher energy range is the one in which usually people look for exotic states. Let's understand how you look for exotic state in chamonium spectroscopy. So this is the picture hmm, in which you see the yellow states that are already introduced, but you see all the states, the states that were not foreseen. Hmm. So below the DD threshold, all the states have been observed and described very well, let me say, by the Charmonium potential model. 
only few of the predicted states above the threshold have been observed, and also those that have been observed show different properties than expected, and there are unexpected states, the red ones. So it's clearly a land for new discovery. We have first focused on that final state, pi pi James I. Why? Because that includes the data, the events that comes from this decay of the Y4260. That is one of the candidates to be an exact state. We consider both the two leptonic decay modes of the James I. And thanks to the fact that you have four charge tracks, you can perform an effective event selection, and what you obtain is basically a signal without background. Hmm? What was the goal in choosing this final state? The purity of the data sample. This data sample is excellent, and uh, the cross-section that we have determined is in perfect agreement with the other measurements from Babar and Bell. Hmm? So we are dealing with something safe. A different approach is considering the pi pi hc final state. In this case, the hc is reconstructed making use of the 16 exclusive decay modes of the ERC. Hmm? And this is the hc data sample that you see once you have clean the data collected at 40 to 60 MeV. I have seen many colleagues the first time that this uh, plot have came out on the market astonished, hmm? because never before BES3 we had so many HC with such a clean line shape. Now, if, you, if we consider the energy dependence of the cross-section, we obtain this distribution that is of the same order of magnitude but different with respect to the one determined by Bell for the James I. Hmm? So we are dealing with different reaction mechanisms that leads potentially to different tools to investigate exotic final states. If we consider the pi pi GMSI final state, we had quite already some surprising results from there. First of all, let's look at the Dalit plots and let's look at the same distribution that we looked at before in the, uh, for the other resonance, that is the pi pi recoil mass you see how we can perfectly describe the recoil mass making use of the non-resonant phase space and of these uh, dominant contributions. Yet, when we look at the other side of the dialysis plot, when you look at the pi James psi for the two charged states, we clearly see contribution that cannot be explained in terms of low energy resonances that are at the exactly the same place the main contribution in the phase space reflection for the two charge states, and that once had it, lead to a clear uh, signal for a resonance that interpreted with an s way breit wiener leads to this resonance parameter and the large statistical significance. Well, this is a pretty much strange beast because it is a charmonious state, that means it has CC plus because it couples to James I, it decays to James I. But it is charged, so it means that it cannot be a QQ bus state. There must be four quarks linked how no one knows. It can be a four, a, a four quark state, there can be a molecule composed of two mesons, it can be whatever. Hmm? But this is definitely remarkable. It has been immediately confirmed by Bell with uh, just 10 days after with uh, comparable resonance parameters, and also by an analysis performed by the CAMSET, the Northwestern University group of QOC, leading again to comparable resonance parameters. So even if it is very young, the ZC state is a new state that belongs to this decay chain and has attracted the, attra the attention of the community almost immediately, because as I said, it's composed of at least four quarks. Now, if we look at the neutral uh, mate, if we look at the neutral final state, we uh, hunted for a state that was first spotted by Clio C, and we found with a large statistical significance, much larger than Clio C, a companion, a neutral companion, 
at all the three center of mass energies we have looked at. That means that we are looking at what could be an isospin triplet, the Zc plus, minu plus and minus, and the Zc zero with these resonance parameters. Now let's have a look to the other state, to the other final state, pi pi hc. Again, we start at looking at a Dallas plot that I remind you has been built making use of exclusive decay modes. And what happens when we fit it is that besides a, a low contribution from a ZC3900 decay to this final state, we see a clear, sharp contribution of a new state. A new state with a large statistical significance, a resonance parameters, a cross-section that shows this energy dependence, and a new state that has a pretty large uh, production ratio, and a new state that is again composed of at least four quarks, because it decays to germonium, this time HC, and because it is um, charged. Hmm? And also in this case, looking at the neutral uh, final state, the mate of the one we have looked at, we see a contribution from, for the HC in the pinot recoil mass that leads to um, an isospin companion, hmm? a neutral isospin companion, with these resonance parameters, still a large statistical significance, and most of all, a cross-section that is roughly half of what of the charge um, of the charge final states. That means that we are roughly following what we expect uh, for isospin invariance. Hmm. So the picture looks already quite complicated. We have a ZC4020 that could be an excited state of the ZC3900, and we have two full isospin triplets. But we are aware of the fact that the ZC3900 and the ZC4020 are very close to thresholds. Which threshold? The ZC3900 is close to the DD star threshold. And if we look at the DD star production, we do see an enhancement near the threshold that can be interpreted with these resonance parameters and the last statistical significance and this product ratio and cross section. The problem is that the mass is slightly different, 1385. Now, this analysis has been performed with what is called a single tag. Single tag means that we reconstruct the buckler of pi and then we tag one of the D, DD star. But if we tag both, then if we perform a double tag analysis, we have a much better control over the systematics and over the resolution. And this is what comes out. These are preliminary results. And as you can see, the resonance parameters are in good, agree in good agreement, but significantly more precise than the single tag analysis. If you look at the other threshold, the D, D star, the D star, D star threshold, again, we see a contribution in the recoil mass of the D, and if we look at the recoil mass of the pi, we see a deviation from the phase space that can be interpreted with these resonance parameters and the large statistical significance. So if we uh, summarize the situation, we have a plethora of states corresponding to charged charmonium states, that can be interpreted as two sets of isospin triplets that can decay in different modes that has to be investigated, collecting more statistics. The spin parities for the moment are completely unknown. Hmm? This is the summary table of all our observations. Um, when you will look at the PDF, you can read the different numbers. Let me stress the key points of that table. And the key points is that we have two isospin triplets in which the charged states are one sigma far from the measurements in the open charm production. In all the cases, we are very close to the threshold, and uh, the ZC states at best 3 for the moment, what is known is that they are near threshold, the isospin is 1, they are composed of at least 4 quarks, 
but we don't yet know if we are speaking of one of two states for each one of the two isospin triplets. ZC was not the only uh, interesting information from the stream. We have also investigated to do X3872. Now, this is interesting to understand how you can play with data. You use the PsyPry ISR signal in order to uh, tune your analysis, and then you add the different center of mass energies in order to look for a contribution around uh, 3872. If you add your data, you do see a clear signal. Hmm? A clear signal that even if is composed of only 20 events, is a signal with a large statistical significance because you have basically no background. Hmm? Now you remember I said you that looking at the line at the energy dependence of the cross section is a way to guess where a particle comes from. If you plot the cross section dependence of the X1372 in the best three data, you see that it perfectly overlaps the Y4260 uh, line shape and has nothing to do with the phase space line shape. That is a clear indication that the X3272 comes from a relative transition of the Y4260 because it perfectly, perfectly overlaps the, um, the line shape of the parent particle. By the way, our resonance parameters are in excellent agreement with the PDG data. So, I just spoke about the ISR. Hmm? Now, the set of uh, best three results is completed. Hmm? I just wanted to give you a hint of what a modern Charmonian experiment can perform with some uh, focus on the experimental difficulties on the experimental techniques in recognizing, extracting information from distributions, and also on the prices that you pay choosing one kind of probe electron instead of others, for example, protons or antiprotons. But then I will use the last 15 minutes to give you some hi other hints on the experimental tools that uh, experimental physicists make use of for this kind of analysis. The first one is ISR, a technique that has been pretty much established by Babar and is now commonly used. Then I will give you a few hints on the upgrade of the Jaminer tracker in the S3, and then a few hints on the cloud computing that is performed to use this kind of, to perform this kind of analysis. So let's start from initial state radiation. Initial state radiation is a trick. You make use of the reconstruction of the radiative photon emitted by the one of the two beams annihilated into the center of mass. Why this trick? Let's say that, for example, to investigate PP, lambda lambda, or NM bar uh, production. That you want, for, for example, to investigate phone factors. Hmm? Which is the problem? The problem is that you cannot go too close to the threshold because if you produce stable uh, hadrons at zero SS energy, then you cannot reconstruct experimentally. Hmm? You can reconstruct on your piece of paper, but not in your data. So the trick of the initial state radiation is to boost the center of mass, because since this photon takes out momentum, the center of mass of the process that we are wanting to investigate is boosted in the opposite direction. And that means that if you make use of the ISR tagging, you can investigate the full set of momentum of the quarks that are composing the hadrons, and thanks to the center of mass boost, you are producing particles that are a threshold in the center of mass of the process you want to investigate, that is this vertex, but are not at, three, at rest in the laboratory frame. And uh, of course, you pay a price. Hmm? You pay the price that you have an energy resolution with which you detect the photon that applies to the energy resolution with which you reconstruct the center of mass energy of the vertex you are looking at that is around 1 MeV. Just to give you an idea, uh, the, um, this is the amount of uh, uh, the fraction of data that ISR may collect with respect to Babar. Why Babar? Because Babar, invent Babar invented the business. Hmm? They are those that for the first time applied on an extensive scale ISR and uh, we will be able to collect twice or three times as more data 
uh, with an important point. Hmm? This is important to understand how you think when you, uh, when you design a detector. We are in a different center of mass region with, with respect to Babar. Hmm? And uh, that means that uh, the situation can be pretty much different. What happens in our case with respect to Babar? In our case, the ISR production is much more peaked in the, f in the central part. Hmm? Our production cross-section is also much lower than Babar. So you may think, okay, look, you produce much less ISR, so you have no advantage of making use of it if compared with Babar. But then you look at the angular distributions. ISR is not something that you look at for free. You look at ISR, resolving it for the hadronic background. Now, the hadronic background is isotropic, is 4 pi. Hmm? It's, it's the same in all the direction. While ISR is more rare at best 3, but is more peaked. That means that if you, prod if you tag your ISR more effectively in the low angle region, the figure of merit the ratio between the ISR that you effectively recognize from the background is the same than Babar. Hmm? This is the rationale of, uh, of, the, of the trick. Hmm? Here I show you clearly how peaked is in the best three energy region the ISR. Hmm? Most of the ISR photons are emitted along the two beam lines and uh, if you look at uh, the mm, acceptance coverage of the detector that roughly is from 10, 20 degrees to 90 degrees in the laboratory frame, then uh, it means that you use 80% of the statistics and you collate only 20%. Now, what about making use of this peak? Hmm? If you use that peak, if you just look at from zero to three milliradians, so very close to the beam sector, then you observe 40% of the statistics of the ISR production. That is double of what you see with all the detectors. Hmm? This is an example uh, why you have to consider not only cross-section, but also the angular distribution of the cross-section when you design a detector. Hmm? When placing in BES-3 the zero-degree detector, a uh, detector that is aimed to cover the first uh, five milliradians in the angle along the beam line with those 40k euros detector of fibers we detect more ISR statistics than with the three million euro volt spectrometer. Hmm? Then some more detectors. BES-3 is aiming to uh, upgrade is in a tracker. We have recently uh, obtained quite a large uh, founding from the H2020 uh, framework. The European Commission founded our project to build a new inner tracker. Why? Okay, first I remind you, if you are not familiar with, the principle of operation of the gems. Hmm? Normally, in the other detectors, you make use of the ionization of the particle in the material that can be silicon or can be just a gas. And then you collect the, uh, you collect the electrons. Then you read charge, that means you read currents. Now, the problem is that if you increase too much the number of particles in the same volume, then you cannot resolve particles between the others. And if you have too many particles, your material can be distracted by radiation damage. The technique of the gems is to produce uh, most of the volume of the detector with zero field. That means zero multiplication. That means zero charge and reduced uh, damage for radiation. And to practice very tiny holes uh, in uh, captain foils with copper in which we have a very large field. Mm? The field that you obtain is 100 k kilovolt per centimeter. Uh, that means uh, 10 megavolt per meter. I remind you that uh, the, a lightning field is one megavolt per meter. Mm? So that is a huge 
uh, field, that means a huge multiplication factor. So what you do basically is when the charge pass by, first drift for free, and then when the electrons are inside the holes, multiplies creating an avalanche. And uh, this avalanche is collected uh, quite far from the interaction region with your material by a set of strips where you basically read charge and time, that means current. Mm? This is a mechanism of the gems. Uh, why using gem? Because you can stand very high rate, 50 megahertz per centimeter, square centimeter is huge. You can have huge gains, mm? 10 to the 4, and most of all because we have a very good resistance to radiation damage and we have an excellent resolution. You can go as down as 60 micrometers if you, if you use analog readout. I will come back to analog readout in a few slides. This is a complicated stuff anyhow. Hmm? The drift velocity change, velocity change automatically when you consider different B fields. So you have to carefully uh, simulate your detector when you design it. Hmm? So we are using Garfield, that is a tool that is provided by CERN, and we are just investigating the full avalanche of, uh, uh, of, these, uh, uh, of the passing by of the particle. The result is a set of signal of the strips, and uh, by performing a fit and investigating the distribution of the strips that fired, you are able to gain in resolution and you are able to obtain a very precise measurement of where and when the electrons reach the emit. We took inspiration from the CLUE2 cylindrical gem detector. It was the first of its kind, composed of a cathode, an anode, and then three layers of gems. Uh, the innovative part of this detector was the cylindrical shapes that was providing a much better acceptance coverage, and the sides, because these gems were very large. Now they are the LSCB gems that are as much as large as these ones, but before these were the largest on the market. They invented a very uh, interesting way of producing them. They just placed the C gems along, uh, along the, uh, some molds, aluminum molds, and then they just uh, uh, build the different layers in order to have uh, uh, precision in the alignment of 100 microns. Hmm? It's not a large quantity, 100 microns in an object that is 2 meters long. What, why BEST3 came into the market and why the European Commission founded us? Well, because we suggested three innovations. First, we change the detector structure. We are using raw cell instead of honeycomb, different material. I will come back to this point. We change the design of the anode and we change the electronics. So, same concept, three almost side points, and the detector is a new detector. Hmm? The material, raw cell is an as hard as honeycomb detector, sorry, substrate to uh, pack the gems and to pack the captain, but it is a significantly lower uh, radiation length. It, you have to remember that in an experiment, in an spectrometer, you want one single target. You don't want many targets. If you have material, you have secondary targets that will mess up your analysis, that will change the resolution of the particles that are crossing your detector. So the less material there is, the better it is. Of course, you have to look for a, an equilibrium because uh, having not the detector collapsing on itself and having few materials. Roacel cuts 35% of the radiation length. So it's a huge gain, a huge gain in the resolution. One more point. Usually, this is the compass style. Hmm? Usually the strips uh, sorry, I forgot to say before I gave it by granted, but maybe it is not. You don't have one single layer of strips. Hmm? You have stereo strips. You have a set of strips with an angle. Because looking at which strip have given uh, signal on each 
a site, then as in a naval battle, you are able to reconstruct where the particle gave the signal. Hmm? So normally, this is the a la compass anode. The strips are placed one over the other. We change the design. We use a jacked design in which the size of the strips is reduced when they are overlapping. That changes the capacity into strip and most of all, the capacity toward the ground. The capacity toward the ground is a key point in a readout electronics because explain you how good may be the analog reconstruction of your signal. The anode has to be validated first with Garfield and then with the prototype test. These are essential. It's not only just to be on the safe side. Each one of the Garfield event ask on an i7 core 28 hours for one event. Hmm? So simulating a cascade, a single cascade, may ask for a month of a core CP, uh, of a core wall time. Hmm? Then the front end electronics. I will spare you the details of the block scheme of the front end electronics. The key point is that we are passing from digital readout to analog readout. That means that we are able to provide the full shape of the signal. That means the full shape of the charge. If you just took a uh, um, If you just uh, uh, took an oscilloscope connected to your detector, this would be what you would see. This is the ground. These are the electrons impacting on the strips. Hmm? So if you reconstruct the shape, you are able to evaluate the centroid and the resolution, that is the width. With these estimations, you are able to determine the gain and to determine the magnetic field. This is how the gain change, changing the magnetic field and changing the gain. So you need to perform detailed studies in order to understand which is the better work point of your detector. This is what would be uh, the final results. This is the beam pipe. You will build the uh, central detector around The central detector will be uh, composed of uh, uh, three layers. Hmm? Each of the three layers is composed of the cathode three gems anode that I described before. And this is the final result. Hmm? The readout electronics will go outside. This is a complete scheme of the detector. It's a bit, more, a bit less than two, two meters long. Hmm? Then uh, I have two minutes, and I will just give you some hints of uh, which are some innovative tools for the computing. Hmm? Because the computing that you are uh, dealing with is a lot of CPU load. Now, up to a few years ago, the main product on the IAP market was grid. Grid computing is come to distinction. Why is coming to distinction? Because only physicists, only high energy physics community make use of it. Hmm? And that means that if you are not mainstream in IT technology, you are out of the stream, you are out of the business. Now, there is a new approach that is making use of cloud computing. Hmm? In Torino, we provided for the first cloud infrastructure optimized for scientific computing that is hosted by the INFM section of Turing. It is not large what we are produced up to now. It will uh, be enlarged uh, pretty soon. It's just 200 cores. But it's the important part is the proof of concept. And the proof of concept is that the cloud is a virtualized environment, is cyberspace on which you install a grid tier two. So the grid infrastructure resides in a completely transparent way on the cloud middleware level. Hmm? You are creating a grid infrastructure in the cyberspace, and that gives all the flexibility that you need in order to have a complete control of your infrastructure. Hmm? This is an, um, a picture of the dashboard. With a notebook, you can control all the system. 
you have the 200 cores, the 600 gigabytes of RAM, you have a set of virtual nodes, and uh, if before a file system or a node of a grid computing site crashed due to a problem in the code or to a mechanical failure, then that required manual intervention, that required manpower, that required money. Now, if a node crash, the system, the watchdog, we re-instantiate the worker nodes in 1800 milliseconds. And that's all. Hmm? Uh, the worker node will come back. The manual intervention is much more reduced. Also, think about, there are two experiments, ALICE and CMS, or COMPASS and MS3, that want to access the uh, same infrastructure. But, Compass use SLF, SLC5 and best three use SLC6. Then that means that you cannot use the same node, that you have to cut the infrastructure in two and you have to use the two a part of the nodes. With a cloud approach, that is not you. You can instantiate as many, uh, as many nodes as you want. Hmm? So, which is the way in which you do it? You create a cyberspace in which the networks, the router, everything is virtualized. Mm? Even the access is virtualized. You have to imagine a set of virtual farms with all their services that resides in cyberspace. And everything can be virtualized and reinstantiated in a matter of milliseconds. Mm? You can have then separate infrastructure on which you can run different services and the different uh, experiments framework of analysis. Hmm? Another example, so it's more clear to understand. Let's consider that you are migrating the software of the experiment, hmm? the analysis and simulation software. Bef we are moving from, uh, coming to the same example, from SLSC5 to SLSC6. That means that before you had to take offline a part of the nodes, reinstall them, and then perform your test. And at the end, when you were convinced that everything was fine, got the green light and have all the analysis migrates to the new system. Now that is not you anymore. On the same metal, the same box, you create two virtual nodes, each for each distribution, and you perform in parallel the test. So your, inf your infrastructure can dynamically switch from testbed to production without no one uh, realizing it because the only one that is aware of the fact that the virtualized node is you that are maintaining the infrastructure. From China, our virtualized grid seems a real grid. There is no difference. Hmm? So this is a much larger flexibility with the key point that you are using mainstream. Hmm? The API, the interfaces that we are using are the same of Amazon Cloud. So in principle, any time you could decide to start our jobs instead than in Torino, on Amazon or on the uh, Google Cloud Computing Farms. Hmm? And then it's a very large flexibility. So coming to the end, here is the summary. I Stress the point that in best 3 we have already collected a huge statistics, but we are analyzing only one sixth, one seventh of our data, and we will collect 10 more, uh, 10 more times of statistics. That means that we will have f before 2024, that is the foreseen deadline of uh, uh, best 3 operation lifetime, two order of many more statistics. It's a huge amount of statistics. That means that uh, we will be able to perform precise measurements that we are nowadays prevented for, from. Many PWA are uh, in progress and will be soon completed. We are also analyzing a full data sample and the BPC2 is climbing in luminosity. So stay tuned because many new exciting results are on their way and because there are a lot of room in uh, upgrading and R&D, both for the detector and the IT side. Thanks for your attention. So, questions? Comments? Please. What 
the highlights are that we will probably have to move from uh, uh, three millimeters to a five millimeter gaps, and the key point is just these ones. Hmm? We were playing with this plot. We were playing along the field versus gain plot because, uh, okay, this is the kind of plot that they're working with. The rationale is this one. If you have a digital readout, you can uh, be more flexible. But if you want to gain with an analog readout, you need a minimum multiplicity of the strips because if you have less than three strips, then you cannot evaluate the centroid. Mm? So uh, to obtain this uh, goal, we determine that the three millimeters uh, uh, gap of Chloe is probably not good enough with higher large magnetic fields and we will move to five uh, millimeters. But the, um, we have to test uh, the stability of the gain with a couple of our test bed in the next future months, something like that. Yes. <laughs> okay, you picked a special case. You picked a special case because Italian collaborators uh, are focused on main analysis, but uh, uh, some of them I could not report on because in the beta stage. Mm. Uh, but the key uh, contribution from uh, Italian collaboration is detectors. The zero degree detector is the one that we proposed. The uh, CGM in a tracker is the one that we proposed and on cloud computing. The contribution from Europe is essential, from Italy in particular, because uh, uh, BES3 was using before us grid, and we moved the computing scheme to cloud. And BES3 was using and is using a drift chamber, and we moved to the CGM approach. By the way, having also the first project approved by the European community in China since 10 years. And also the zero degree detector is ours. And we just added all the physics of the form factors and of the gamma gamma processes. In so we are mainly focused on the feasibility studies and on the, uh, on the application of our innovation. But if you consider US people, Germany, Germ basically 10 institutions from Germany join BES3, Sweden, Russia,